Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Lana Peterson, and I'm the Professional Development Manager at National Youth Leadership Council. And I just am here to introduce Kate McPherson, today's webinar presenter. Um, Kate is the director of, I want to get this right, Project Service Leadership. And she will be leading us through her latest publication, um, um, Learn, Serve, Succeed, Tools and Techniques for Youth, youth in Service Learning. So I'm going to hand it over to Kate now. Great. Thanks, Lana. Um, welcome to the webinar. Um, we're kicking into summer, and I'm looking forward to having a chance to share some of the resources and information we were able to put together um, for the Search Institute. What tools and techniques that I think would be helpful, mostly it's focused on school-based service learning, but it also has an, a value, I think, to community-based organization. And I worked in partnership with some of the staff at NYLC to put this book together for the Search Institute. Um, while I always kind of prefer being in person and actually seeing and talking with people, what's valuable about the webinar, I think, is that people from all parts of the country are able to be part of our conversation. And also, with a recording that NYLC will do, what's nice is it can be available at other times as well. So I want to welcome you to our uh, webinar session. And um, what I'd like you to do is to take a few minutes now, and as I'm giving a little bit of an introduction, take time in that chat box area to put down your um, name, a little bit about your organization, that is if you work for an elementary school or you work with a, in a community-based organization, sort of what context it is that you're working, and most importantly, what you hope to learn from today's a webinar. What is it that would be of greatest value to you so when the webinar is over, you can say, this is really good use of my time. So take that, and as you're doing that, I'm going to give you a little bit of background information on myself. Um, both, some of you don't know me, and so it's to give you a little bit of sense of who I am, but more importantly from my perspective, as I share with you what I've done, there may be things that you hear in what I'm saying that would be of interest to you or would be helpful to you in your context. So I just want to give you a little bit of background on what brought me to be working with service learning. My work um, in this field is really deeply rooted in my experiences as a classroom teacher. Uh, mostly in the secondary grade levels, and that I taught initially in an inner city eighth grade with uh, particularly young boys who were really struggling readers. This was my first year of teaching, and I was really out of desperation trying to find something that would really help my students' um, learning come alive. And at the time, we didn't call it service learning. It was instead something that I just seemed to make sense to me, is that my eighth graders got partnered with a second grade classroom. And my eighth graders were able then to teach second and third graders some of the basic reading skills that they really needed to review and recover themselves. And as a classroom teacher, what struck me was for the first time, my students wanted to learn to read. And it was never for the A and B. It was instead because they had a young student in that second grade classroom who was so looking forward to having them come down and teach them. And it was that pivotal experience that really I saw, I saw firsthand the sort of transformational quality of service learning because my kids had been needy their whole lives, but they had not been needed. And it was sort of this recontextualizing learning that I saw as having an opening. And it's when, then when I started to use and adapt service learning into lots of different contexts. I've taught in a private school um, where kids who were of kids of privilege uh, in a contemporary world problems class. And they, um, sorry, they were um, uh, able to work 
uh, and study the issue of hunger and homelessness by working directly with um, young men who are transitioning from the streets to finding permanent housing. And they began to understand the complexities of people struggling with mental illness and what kinds of roles did the community need to play. And so when we studied this issue of hunger and homelessness, the kids were curious and really concerned about what it is we needed to do to address the issues of mental illness in our community. And and our students actually worked on a campaign to help students who are struggling with mental illness get support at their own local high school. Um, and then I've also served for many years as a service learning consultant for K-12 schools and teacher ed. And one of my most, uh, most uh, enjoyable uh, work was with a school that went school-wide with service learning, where every academic class really embedded service learning as a part of making sure that every graduate graduated with a sense of social responsibility and skills. And that whole program, staff development, was actually led by students. They had a class called um, Leadership for Service. And during that class time, the students would help set up the service learning partnerships with the community that enriched classroom learning for teachers in all the different subject areas. And the last time I was there, it was students leading the staff development session, bringing to teachers um, really exciting projects that helped breathe life into instruction. And after many years of working as a consultant, I became real interested in how does policy support service learning? Because I kept finding schools would have vibrant service learning programs, and then a principal would leave, or a teacher would leave, and it seemed to be that it would disappear, um, or at least diminish significantly. Um, and so I became interested in working in our state. Um, every student's required in Washington State to do a culminating project. So my work then began to work with teachers or districts or schools that were implementing this graduation requirement of a senior project and helping them think about how do we make sure that students who are doing these projects were doing work that was actually meaningful to them and meaningful to the community, and creating clearer structures and, and resources to help students to be successful in those projects, rather than what had happened before was people would sort of require hours of service, and people go out and do something. But it wasn't necessarily connected to anything that the students valued or that felt particularly meaningful. So I've developed some resources, both online and in print. Um, to help school districts that really want to have students do civically rich projects. And then most recently, I worked with the Coalition of Essential Schools, helping teachers that were looking at authentic, engaged instruction to see how the service learning lens. And we worked with a network of six high schools in Oregon and Washington. And this was where, within the instructional improvement plan and in their professional learning communities, service learning was a thread uh, as they looked at everywhere that they were trying to improve instruction. So it became more embedded in their school improvement planning. And currently, I'm working at Roosevelt High School in Oregon, which has the lowest achieving high school um, grades in, uh, in terms of Oregon. And we're creating a near peer writing and publishing center. And so we're engaging college and high school students as writing consultants. And we're creating a publishing center. Um, so um, I'm really loving my current work um, in a more localized level and working directly with students. So these experiences kind of were the seeds that helped me put together the book with the Learn and Serve grant. Um, and this is uh, the, we created Learn, Serve, and Succeed. Um, and in here, uh, at the very beginning, where it talks about the elements of successful service learning, is much of the research done by um, NYLC. And then we've looked at the different elements of um, how to build a service learning project that is really academically rigorous, aligns the standards, but also addresses some of the unique needs of a particular setting, uh, whether that be around diversity or youth voice. And then one of the challenges that I've been looking at over these years is how do we sustain this work so it doesn't just become 
sort of what I call that Fourth of July phenomenon. That sort of ooh ah, and isn't this wonderful? And then in a year or two, it disappears. So I'm really looking at how do we sustain it, um, both in our own lives and in the policies and practices of school improvement. So um, this is just kind of a context we worked on this uh, last year, and it came out this fall. So I guess I want to take time to kind of welcome you and see what your goals and interests are. So it looks like um, Jennifer and sister at a primary school, um, so elementary teachers, elementary students. And is that, and that's, and that's probably school-wide, I would assume. Yeah, OK. Does anybody else want to put some of their ideas? Wanna, um, I, I'd be curious, are the students in your school, do you see this as an area of really high achievement, a high achieving school? Or is it a ch school where there's some really challenges in terms of academic achievement? And Kate, if you want to just scroll up, yeah. you'll see other people's responses to the same question. Too. Oh, OK. I was trying to scroll down. I'm sorry. I'm kind of a techno peasant at times. So a service learning coordinator. Is, is Pine Lake, I'd be curious if Pine Lake is a K-12 or is it a high school? Elementary, charter school, definitely challenged. OK. Appreciate my taking just a few minutes here to kind of see. So after school and leadership program, great. I'm going to just do a little, there's a little gadget here on the um, form where you can raise your hand. I would be curious if you'd raise your hand if you work with high school students. How many of you work with middle school students? Elementary students? And how many of you already have um, maybe three or more years of experience with service learning? Okay. And how many of you um, have already started to do some service learning, but have not had many years? Okay. And how many of you are brand new to the idea of service learning? Okay. Thank you. Just trying to get a sense of the of people and kind of what your needs are. So as we're going through. Um, I think one of the things I'll emphasize around is that whole area around some of the academically challenged students. Um, please feel free in the chat room to ask questions. Oh, so the hand is above the names? Um, yeah, OK, so I saw that. OK, so this helps me kind of frame the seminar, because I always like to try to address specific questions. So send any questions through the chat room. And then um, I'll try to pay attention to those questions. And also, Lana's going to also raise those questions as she sees them come up. So I can make sure what we're doing is really addressing your needs so that the goals you have for this session are met. So the first chapter in the book really focuses on the elements of successful service learning, um, which I think NYLC has done a really phenomenal job of researching and capturing a lot of the elements that take you through the service learning cycle. And then each chapter goes more deeply into each one of those chapters. And the first one that we really focus on is ways to really set academic goals. And in the chapter, there are a series of questions. And I'm going to give some examples through each of those questions that I think are a nice way for a teacher, whether that be in a 
charter school or a private school um, where you might have kids of greater privilege, or if it's um, a, a school of challenge, these same questions, I think, often help a teacher to kind of guide them to develop a service learning context that makes sense for their classroom. And what I want to give examples of how some teachers have done this in a way that really has academic rigor. Um, because I think even as I look back at my first experience with service learning, the experience could have been much more effective for the learning of my students had I been more intentional about the preparation and training and the elements that are really a part of creating an effective service learning program. So an example here, this is a program where the students um, who are struggling readers um, at Discovery Middle School um, are not just placed in working with elementary students, but they are actually trained in reading strategies. And they are taught what it is that it takes for somebody to master certain reading concepts. And in the process of putting together lessons and activities to teach the younger students, their own reading scores become better. And this and Discovery Middle School found that not only did their own students' GPAs and academic grades go up, but they were so effective at changing the reading scores of the elementary students that it became the elementary school that paid the cost of the transportation for the students to come down there because it was uh, the one of the best interventions and support the elementary school had found for their struggling readers. So this was a really, it's called Kids Care, and it's at Discovery Middle School. Another example is where you can think, so if I'm teaching um, technology for middle school students and I'm trying to teach them about writing, I could create a product. And the product the students here created were called personalized storybooks. So the second grade classroom teacher was trying to teach her students how to um, deal with con have, how stories have conflict in them and how oftentimes there's sort of two points of view that need to come to some kind of resolution in order for the story to come to um, some conclusion. So the students in the eighth grade classes went in and they interviewed these younger students, the second grade students who are emerging readers. They found out their favorite colors, their favorite activities, what they, if they had a pet or a dog, some of the things they liked to do. Then the eighth graders created a book that was personalized to that young person and actually created a, them as a hero in their own story that had a conflict that got resolved. So the elementary kids took home with them a book that was personalized and written for and included them in the story. And those kids kept reading their story over and over and over again because they were the hero in their own story. The eighth graders were learning how to format the book, how to edit their own writing, how to um, use the computer to actually create a booklet that um, was you know, effectively sharing the story that they had written um, for their, their buddies. So it's an example of how you can create a product that has value beyond the classroom. Or rigorous academic learning embedded in an event. So in this case, to the left, you see a student who looks like they're doing a survey. This is a student doing a senior project where she really got concerned about the lack of youth voters. And she investigated what it is that what she felt could make a difference in increasing the number of eight 18-year-olds and, and to 21-year-olds who were voting. And she actually engaged the um, local Secretary of State to come down and talk with students about the importance of voting. But she mobilized a cadre of young adults to actually do um, a, get out and register students to vote in various events. So her event really was a whole voter registration event. The other possibility is to think about research and how can students' research contribute to the community. And this can be at any age. This is a group of students that are actually working at a high school to um, uh, 
research the quality of the biodiesel oil that their small engines classes are producing. But another student group of students all across the state of Washington were also involved with a human genome project where the students actually um, gathered and collected data about some of the genetic coding and then collectively gathered that and that information is now stored at the National Health Institute. Um, so student research can be a real valuable service learning project. Or here's an opportunity where students studied um, about um, the legislation, legislative policy. This is our governor in the state of Washington signing into law a bill that the students passed as a result of their advocacy. In this case, it's to require that civics be in a part of Washington state history, which is a required class. And this is an example on the right of where students take what they're learning and they use it in a way that is socially entrepreneurial. Um, the students have actually, um, in the marketing class, created an event at their high school called um, Mr. Hudson's Bay. And Mr. Hudson's Bay is an event where the students create a mock beauty pageant and then the beauty pageant's a fundraiser. They have raised so much funds that a whole uh, wing of the hospital at, at uh, Dorn Becker Hospital is actually named after this high school because they've raised over $600,000. So these are examples also of how, or can I take my project and solve a problem? Um, this is a, students who have looked at the issue of their elementary school was being remodeled and they wanted to make the program uh, to be more environmentally responsible. So they researched and presented to the school board their recommendations of having eco roofs built onto the top of the, of the, um, of the roof of that school as it was being rebuilt. And then here's examples of working with an existing organization, METRA, where the students actually promoted awareness about the DREAM Act and the importance of understanding immigration. So in the book are just an, a series of questions that I think help teachers start with their content as the beginning place and then think about how could students teach others, create a product, solve a problem, deal with public policy. I just wanted to give some examples of those in action. And then in the book are questions that help you think about are there connections that begins between your course learning and possible service learning projects? Is there a portion of your curriculum that makes a natural connection to the community? Or is your theme or content, as it, or could it be related to an issue? Or here's one I find kind of helpful. Is there some content that is boring to you or your students? <laughs> and could it come alive by being connected to a real issue? So in one school where they were working on US, studying US history in World War II, the students interviewed people and their lives and how World War II affected their lives. And then they created a book about that history. So one element is really just how do you create the tie? And I was trying to share with you kind of the rigor element of it, which is really the preparation, the prior learning that has gone into all of those projects. So if you would, in the chat room, or actually you can use this letter A over here, and you can actually type onto the text some examples of rigorous academic learning that either you are a part of or that you're aware of, that you feel or there's a real strong connection between the learning and the Just let everybody know the A tool is in between the names on the left hand side in the presentation. There's a little toolbox that goes vertical in the middle and the A tool is the fourth tool down. Um, and you click on that tool and then click anywhere right on the screen and kind of use it as a whiteboard. So if you can just type onto the text here, an example can be just a little note of 
something that maybe it's a teacher in your classroom or what? Great. Great. This is really helpful for me to get a sense of what people are doing or are aware of. Um, my thought is that um, people seem to have, a, some, at least from this evidence, there seems to be a lot of people who have already established some partnership and some connection that's very clearly connected to the learning. Um, the one thing that um, you know, is an area that I'm particularly interested in is how do we make sure that the learning is rigorous and it looks like a lot of you have done a, a lot to sort of embed that in terms of um, thinking about having dimensions of the work that require students to teach others um, or build kind of a plan of action, like in this case present the plan of lighting improvement to the city council. Um, and the opportunity for students to teach younger students. So it looks like that whole framework that we outlined at the beginning is something that many of you probably are fairly familiar with. I would say as a principal in an elementary school, sometimes using those specific questions where people start with the curriculum rather than what service learning could we do, but rather what are you trying to teach and where does that lead you when you think about teaching others might be a helpful tool to help your teachers generate projects um, that otherwise might not come to their mind. And I've done that in staff development where people have, where a teacher might be wanting to figure out a way to do a service learning project but hasn't quite developed an idea and having them work in a team of people to kind of generate uh, things that could be tightly aligned to the curriculum in the ways that most of your examples seem to be showing. I think because you are, it looks like most of you already have partnerships, I'm not going to dwell on the partnership part of the book. I'm instead going to um, just mention a couple of examples here that might be worth noting and then mention this as again a tool that could be useful for teachers that may be needing to develop a partnership or 
expand the partnership. The one thing I would say is well, like around your engineering project, there may be some ways with your energy conservation you already are, have worked with the city. There may also be a possibility of building a partnership with a business. An example I had at, um, in Seattle was Seattle City Light. Once the students had come up with some ideas around energy conservation, PG, or Seattle City Light actually contracted with their high school to do energy conservation uh, assemblies. And it was their budget that they normally use for conservation assemblies that paid for the transportation and for the opportunity for students from that high school to travel to elementary school to do conservation assemblies. And then they found that the quality of the assemblies was better than when they had hired professional people in the past. So it was a cost savings for them. It was a budget partnership with the high school. And it was also a way for both PGE, in this case, I'm sorry, Seattle City Light and in this case, Ballard High School to kind of meet their learning and community goals. Another example with your ELL program uh, where you're trying to learn, do the um, Spanish and English skills. We worked with a local um, Burgerville. It's a fast food place, but they provide meals that are called kids' meals. It's a very sustainable, nationally regarded uh, chain. But our students actually created bilingual little storybooks that went into the kids' meals. When kids came through, they were able to have stories that encouraged reading during the summer. And the students had a chance to have a, uh, create a book that was known by lots of people in the community because it was being distributed by Burgerville. Um, so just to think about as you're partnering, um, not only partnering with the school or as you develop ELL curriculum and materials, I have found most libraries really would love to have story, books that are written by students in the public library system, in their loaning system. And I, we've had the library have author's nights, celebrate the books that students have written, and then it became part of their lending library. And again, it had students uh, really have a sense that what they were writing and developing had significant value uh, to the community at large. Um, so I think because most of you already have your partnerships with other schools, just think about is there a way that one of the other partners could either help um, and support your efforts? Um, communities, universities, and colleges often have um, work study students in um, the uh, teacher education program. We are working on an oral history project at Roosevelt, and it's the social studies um, teachers uh, who are helping and partnering with us so that future social studies teachers will actually have had a hands-on experience with oral history. And then our students have a, a mentor and an advocate to help their service learning project and, and their publication be successful. So these in the book is simply a list of some of the different partners that are pretty natural. But then these are questions that you can ask a community organization about um, who they are and what their needs are. But what I have found is quite often if you approach an agency only around what their needs are, they think about a volunteer opportunity for students. They don't necessarily think about something that would easily be a service learning partnership. And I'll give one example of that, where I worked with a shelter and we said we had middle school students who cared about homelessness wanting to do a project related to that. How could they be of help? And they said, well, on Sunday we need to help provide meals. And we said, well, that doesn't really Really work well with our time and structure, but what's the mission of your organization? And the mission was to really help people transition from homelessness to, um, to be able to have housing. But their biggest dilemma was that people didn't really know that they served so many veterans, and they didn't know the organization very well in this community. And we asked, well, what would help that happen? And they said, well, we've always wanted a newsletter to help provide our story. So what we did is we did actually had students interview but create the newsletter, which we did from the school. 
and then it provided and advanced the mission of the organization. But the organization would not in, you know, have automatically thought of students doing their newsletter. They uh, automatically thought of them as being hands-on volunteers at the site. So the questionnaire in here may be helpful and helping as you work with organizations to think about are there things that are the mission of the organization that your products or your students could help either through research, through in, uh, invention, um, or is there some challenge that that organization is facing? In this case, it was being known by the community. And our students were then able to help them address that barrier. So the questions that are in the book are really to kind of open up um, the possibilities about how to best partner with organizations in a way that's meaningful to them and advances your academic skills that you're trying to teach, but isn't uh, I think we have to be thoughtful. We don't have as much money or time for some of the community field trips. So are there ways that students can actually contribute more meaningfully by using the talents and skills they have in the classroom, like that newsletter production, than it would be to go down um, on a weekly basis to the organization and be of service, when in many cases they actually had more volunteers to do that than, were, than they needed. So these interview questions are helpful in terms of discerning new ways of thinking about how to partner um, with, uh, the, with the school around learning. This is an example of how we partnered in Evergreen School District. Every eighth grader uh, was expected in a team to do a, a service learning project. And they would identify a theme or an area that they were interested in. They would go and actually do some direct service in that agency for a chunk of six, five hours. It was really more to learn about the organization. Then they would do research related to the questions that they had discerned from that investigation and that learning in the community, as well as the research. Then they would create a service project that was actually sort of a legacy. And what we did to support the learning for the students was to create clarity for the community-based organization about what was the purpose of our exit project, and then where did the service experience they were having at their organization actually fit in the larger piece of both the learning and the service. And then we created tools to help them know what they could do as a community partner to support the students' learning and to enhance their learning uh, and enhance the benefit to the community. So I think one of the things I've learned through my work is the importance of taking time to really see the community as an educating partner not only the receiving of service, because many nonprofits are actually have staff who are well, um, some of them former teachers, care a lot about education itself. And so they were able to really actually create materials to help guide student research. They were willing to serve as mentors. The students then made presentations about what they'd learned through both their service, the research, and why they had chosen their kind of legacy service as an expression of what they had learned. And the agency members were often willing to come down and be the people who listened to those presentations. So really seeing it as a partnership for service and learning, to me, is a real key kind of shift that I have um, kind of nurtured over time. And I always am delighted with the eagerness of the community partners to really play a larger role if they understand what it is that we as teachers are really trying to do through the learning of the classroom. Same thing true with the elementary classroom. Once they know what it is that are the reading or math targets for your students, having students actually um, be reinforced um, by the elementary teacher um, in the questions that they ask, the kind of context that they create, um, really supports the learning happening in both places. In some cases, the nonprofit was even willing to kind of build in uh, a learning assessment at the site. Um, around some of the content that students were learning about the issue. Um, 
and uh, again, it really sort of strengthened both the service to the community and the partnership felt really validated as that they were really a co-learner, co-teacher in this project. So those resources are in there as well as examples of pro partnerships in some of those different contexts. So I guess what I'd like to have you share here in a similar way we did before is so what are some ways in which you are either partnering or some things you've learned through your to build a strong partnership. So for those of you who have pretty multiple partners, I'm really curious, what are some things you've learned that's needed to sort of sustain those? How are you, what are some ways that you're ensuring that those partnerships last and that they're really enhancing student learning? And I've asked that of any of the other ones that have listed what you're doing. What are some ways that you're ensuring that this partnership really enhances the, the learning for students? What are some things you've done there? Great. Sounds like we have a lot of people who have had a lot of experience with the partnership piece. And the, I, I'm hoping, you know, one of the things that this tool in the book is just to kind of help um, students, I mean, the, validate the fact that uh, the community partner is truly a co-educator and that we need to look at ways to sort of make that more um, clear as we enter into partnerships with the community. Um, i trying to think if there's anything else. As I look at your examples here, these are great.
And I like the idea that one person had about sharing the data. So to what degree, if our goal really is in our cross-age tutoring program, that not only our elementary students' reading is improving, but our middle school tutors' reading is improving, is that happening? It's a great way to engage as not just a sort of a partner as a recipient, but really that we're together building a program so that the students benefit, all the students benefit, the elementary as well as the middle school tutors. Great. OK, looks like we have lots of good, strong experiences here. And they survey both the ch I like this idea that you know both the adult and student participants. Student projects include rubric assessment and progress checklists. So the community partners able to see that as well as the um, classroom teacher. And I have to agree that that whole around relationship is so key. I think it's trust. It's really. Um, having a good time together in your conversations with each other, being able to laugh, being able to appreciate the situation that other person's in, and thinking about how is it genuinely enhancing their life as well as enhancing the work of our students. And then I do think at some point having some things that are written is a communication. So I find community partners often change, just like teachers change. So if you're doing something that's district-wide, ensuring that you have some means of written communication that is really succinct about the role of what each person will do in order to make the partnership work. Great. Um, and then the, another area is just ways to engage students in um, being one of the groups that outreaches to community partners. Again, I think that depends a lot on the context in which the service learning program is happening. But um, in, our, in the exit projects, where part of what the students were wanting to do is as middle school students, they were really asked to kind of think about a particular issue and then identify what it is that they could do um, around that issue to make a difference, then it was really part of their process. Or I know some of you mentioned um, Project Citizen. The, there, the students are identifying an issue, and then they have to go out and investigate um, that community issue and then begin to define what kind of policy or program um, can make a difference. So having the, these questions just kind of help students to kind of think about where are their connections um, and that they can make between what they're learning in the classroom and the community partners out there. And this is where you really engage the student as investigator. So where would you like, where do you start? Because some schools start with the learning objective, which tends to be my bias, having been a classroom teacher, that I tend to start there. Other people um, start where they have a natural partner. Um, and where would you put yourself um, on this grid as to where you start with the um, your work with service and learning. In this activity, we're going to ask you to go to the toolbox and the second symbol down looks like a sunburst. If you want to grab that, it will create a little symbol um, like this. And you can put it anywhere on the quadrant. Um, maybe it's in between two different ones that you'd like. So if you want to grab that symbol, put it somewhere on the quadrant.
this is where I wish we had more capacity for conversation. <laughs> so I have a hard time with the, you know, the framework. But at least it's an interesting lens here on um, being able to see where people sort of start with um, their work. And we all know that in, it gets, as we work deeper with the community partner, it often can mean that the, mean, the service becomes more meaningful because we understand their needs. And depending on um, the context in which we're doing the work, uh, more and more youth voice can also become part of it. Um, So I'm going to move on because we only have a few minutes. Then the other area, and it sounds like from your examples that you gave earlier, many of you are already thinking about this element. This was an element that I must say several years ago was not as clearly embedded in service learning planning. It was more about how do we have students do a project that makes breathes life and aliveness into learning. But it wasn't about to what degree does it really clearly help students um, enhance their learning skills. And um, how do we know that that's actually happened? So in the book, it's just some tools. And it seems like many of you are already pretty proficient with this. So rather than dwell on it, I'll just give a couple of examples. But this is a planning process. So if you're working with a team of teachers or you're working um, yourself, it's just a way of thinking, what are the real learning goals that I have? What academic standards are this going to address? Or are we focusing on civic skills and predispositions? Um, what questions will they explore? And then what means of assessment will I use to determine that? And also in there is a grid. Um, this is a grid I have found really helpful. When I think about if I'm trying to have d assess mastery of knowledge, what kinds of assessments seem to be most helpful? So, and it kind of gives you this grid sort of helps you understand that um, which approach might be best for different kinds of mastery. So an essay can be used to assess knowledge that's mastered as an effective use of materials. Or it can serve to assess mastery of complex structures. An essay can be complex structures of knowledge. Or selective response would be sort of like your normal true-false questions or respond to things. They can be used to assess the content knowledge. Um, or personal communication, if you're trying to assess knowledge, is good for narrow domains of knowledge when short-term record keeping is required in the sense that you can um, set down where if you're trying to understand whether a student's learned certain knowledge of history, then you, can, you could have conversations between people to discern whether they've learned that information. But there's going to have to be some kind of record keeping um, in order to uh, determine whether or not they actually have mastered that information. So this grid is just a useful tool if you're trying to do reasoning. Then writing, where students have a description of problems where they solve a solution. Um, they do an essay around reasoning, then it can provide a really good window to their their reasoning. So if you have something where you're trying to have students, um, for example, write an essay where they are perhaps looking at a water quality issue, and they've studied this in the classroom, and you're wanting to make sure that they understand the whole process by which you would discern what kind of strategy should be taken to resolve a particular dilemma that the students are trying to um, think about, then writing an essay could be a great way to understand their thinking process and being able to articulate that. We had a student, for example, when they did the culminating project, we didn't ask them to just assess whether or not their project was had made a difference. We had a little grid where they had to put on a certain continuum the quality of impact their project had on the community. But then we had them write an essay that described why they evaluated themselves in that manner. And why did they feel it was either a strong impact or wasn't a strong impact. And that gave a lot of uh, transparency to why students felt certain things were important to do or made a difference. So it was a great way for us to, as you know, rather than just assess 
and judge uh, sort of on a surface level, it really allowed us to think of their moral reasoning that was behind their choice and well, how they had made that decision. So I'm not going to read the whole grid, but I do find this grid really helpful when you think about what it is that my students are really trying to achieve and then what kind of assessment students could use in order to determine whether that has actually been accomplished. And um, what I'm finding is that we rubrics are a great way to do certain elements of these achievement targets, and particularly when you're dealing with things like products. But sometimes we also need to marry that with some standardized assessment strategies. Um, are they able to recognize certain information that they didn't know before? Um, were they able to, um, uh, to articulate and draw um, in a drawing sort of the key uh, concepts that you were wanting them to understand in terms of the information of that particular content? Um, so in your engineering project, um, you probably are trying to get at certain um, thinking skills, but you're also trying to get at certain knowledge. So you may have to have a blending of uh, ways in which you assess that learning. And in the book, there are just a few examples of teachers who have done that um, and how they've gone about assessing that particular um, project that they were doing. Like a reading score, they actually, when they were doing a cross-age tutoring, tutoring program, they actually used word recognition and word meeting skills. They actually um, were able to uh, demonstrate uh, the importance of ideas. They were taking a standardized test assessment. They were doing a miscue analysis test. They had teacher observations about students' ability and comfort at different reading levels. And then they had reading logs um, that determined both the volume and level of difficulty of the students' reading. So they, they thought about different ways of assessing um, the student learning that was happening in that tutoring program. Or another teacher, when they were um, doing a science project, they again, um, and this is again in the book, but it just kind of gives a lens on the kinds of things that are in there. They were doing a water quality. They actually had an essay question that substantiated the content knowledge. They were given pictures and descriptions of organisms in the food web, and then students had to arrange those um, in order of producer to various consumer levels. And then students identified the energy source and direction of the energy travels and label um, each as a scavenger or decomposer and describe the effects and forces of the sun, moon, and centrifugal forces on ocean tides. So just as an example of how one goes about building that assessment, the tools is um, that chapter is not as comprehensive, and one of the things we're working on our website are more examples of specific ways in which teachers have built that assessment into their program. And then this is a tool at the end, if you're working with uh, lots of teachers that might be helpful, where it guides people through thinking about um, the planning, what standards, what civic skills, are they embedding career-related learning standards? What do they think will be the community impact, the design and preparation and reflection, the action plan, how will they evaluate its effectiveness, and then how will student learning be affected? So it's community, the evaluation is both on the community and on the learning. And these have examples of different ways in which one might go about assessing um, student learning. The other chapters are really about um, student voice, how do we deal with diversity and culture, um, civic education, and how do we make sure that there's a sort of civic dimension and, and intentional learning in, as a part of a program or some examples like Project Citizen, which I think is a really outstanding process, and then planning and preparing for success, as well as reflecting and demonstrating. So at the end, I'll tell you how you can access the book. Um, but what I'd like to do is, are there any questions? Because most of you, at least from your examples you have given, this book was kind of more geared to people who are kind of more at the 
awareness level, but already are familiar with service learning enough that they want to really delve a little more deeply than just at the beginning stages. But I would love to answer questions that actually help you meet your goal, because it seems like many of you are a little more advanced in your practice. And probably many of the tools here are things that um, you would either be familiar with or might be something that um, you know you would have been would have been helpful earlier in your development. Oops, what happened? I don't know what happened. What are you trying to do, Kate? How oh, did it happen? I don't know. I got slipped to something else. I got to the learn and serve thing, and now I can't get back to you. I don't know where you went. Oh, here you are. I don't know what happened. Up. Oh. <laughs> I don't know where I am. OK, here we are. So any questions, let's see. When starting, do you recommend first um, when I think with an elementary school, a strong recommendation, I would say, is a little of both. Um, I think having a few teachers who are strong leaders, who where it's a real natural inclination of um, how they want to go about teaching students, and, and having them begin to do some work. But I think uh, the school administrator is often such a um, pivotal person in ensuring that this is part of kind of the vision and direction the school wants to go. So um, and that would depend kind of on your role in that school. But we worked with one school where we started with the, with the principal and got clear about what her, in this case, vision was for the school. And then what we were able to see is that what service learning offered was clearly aligned. Even though the administrator didn't call it service learning, she was very committed to cross-age tutoring. She saw its value, but had never heard of service learning. So having a conversation with her and seeing what her vision was, and then seeing how we could help her see that service learning really was an an application of the concepts of cross-age teaching and other, uh, and, you know, implemented in slightly different ways through the different forms of service. And then that school, what they ended up doing was actually creating a school-wide tutoring program at the second grade, where every fourth grader and every second grader were paired up as cross-age tutors. But then every grade level, also, the teachers found a content area that could come alive through service learning. And the fifth grade teacher, for example, was studying migration. They created, because they were part of a migratory bird place, they actually created a bird habitat. The second grade teachers were creating an environmental and recycling project in their school. But they, each teacher's grade level found a theme that was pivotal to their grade level. And then they developed a service learning um, way of enriching that content area. But the teacher embraced it because they also saw, or the principal saw, the value of this um, tutoring program. And it had her realize the value of having her students be of service. And so I would say starting with both is really important. And the more you can network a principal with other principals through um, uh, the generator school network or through other venues, the more the principal will get an expanded view of what's possible through service learning and can help the teachers have the resources and support they need to be successful. I think individual teachers can do it on their own. But if you're trying to integrate it throughout the school, you pretty much need uh, the principal as a, an ally in that work. Oh, that's very, yeah. Yeah, so um, 
I actually was in a similar place as a parent volunteer with my daughter's school. And uh, what I did was I talked with the principal about what were some of the programs um, they th thought were successful in the school that they wanted to enhance. And then also, where were some of the play? In this case, it was technology. They were just starting to do some things with technology. And so I was able to partner and bring in some people from the community to help them create an intergenerational technology program. Oh, it looks like we're closing up here. So any other quick questions? So um, we have a competition. Um, so any of you who would like a book of the uh, Learn, Serve, Succeed, um, then you're welcome to submit your app, uh, competition by responding to these two questions and sending them to Lana Peterson. And these are what have you learned or relearned today, because many of you seem to be people who are pretty experienced. So it may be it's just reaffirming something that will help you build and sustain a service learning programs, or what ways have you developed your program so it's most likely to sustain. I'll leave this up for a second. Um, and anyone who responds will be entered into a drawing to win a copy of Learn, Serve, and Succeed. I'm going to go to the end just to give you my contact number. And then I'll tell you how you can learn, serve, succeed yourself. And then back to this so that you can respond to that and send an email. Kate, I did put the questions in the chat box too. Okay, so thank you. They're, so in the left, they're in the bottom chat box too. Okay. 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 So thank you so much for joining us. And at this thank point, you so much, Lana, Kate, for just presenting. We really, really appreciate farewell. it. And I hope yeah. everybody, if you don't win, please go out and get um, Learn, Serve, Succeed. I will say, um, from a practitioner standpoint, it's very different than a lot of the service learning books you'll see because Kate is one of the own uh, one of the only people who are out there writing books who's actually in the field at the same time and so it's really from more of a practitioner standpoint and so I really encourage you to get the book thank you Kate so much And we'll stay You're online welcome. just for a little Take bit care. if there is any other questions. Um, and feel free to email Kate um, or myself yeah. as well.